fullness of life on this side. Amen? Anybody with me? So Y'all going to have to wake up with me a little bit this morning. I know there's a hand, just not, not uh, everybody here today, but I want y'all to wake up with me because I'm talking about being fully alive and you're all sitting there looking at me like I'm, a, uh, you know, something crazy. Come on, be a fully alive. That's God's desire for you, that you would be fully alive. Now, I'm going to share some scriptures with you this morning that the Lord put on my heart, and even over the last two weeks, and I, I didn't quite get to all of these last Sunday because I, I just got too excited about the ones that I shared with you last Sunday, so I didn't get very far. So sometimes that happens, but that's okay. But I do want to share with you a few things that the Lord's put on my heart that I believe are going to stir up some wonder in you, and I believe they're going to call you into a full expression of the life of Christ within you. I don't think that God wanted any one of us to just live through this life enduring it and sucking it up and, and making it through and just, just, just getting by until Jesus shows up or we die and go home to be with him. I believe we're meant to be more than conquerors, amen? I believe we're meant to be overcomers, amen? I believe we're meant to be those that are above only and not beneath and the head and not the tail. And, and come on, I believe God wants us to live life fully. He wants you to be a full expression of his life and his goodness to the earth. You know the reason why a lot of people don't want to become Christians? Because they've seen Christians and they're grumpy. And they're depressed and they're, they're, they, got, they got problems just like the rest of the world. And, and so they're going, why would I want to join that crew? Why would I want to be like them? They fuss and fight and argue and split and talk bad about each other. Come on. They do all this stuff, they get, they, they get their, their all, I was going to say some things, but you know what I'm saying? They get all upset about stuff that don't matter, come on, the world knows that, the world's sitting around going, look at these fools, sitting around talking about they know God, and meanwhile they're, they're just as miserable as the rest of the world. Why would I want to be like that? That is not full life. That is, that is living beneath the kingdom level that God has called us to, that he died for. Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead to give you fullness of life. He said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Not just let life happen to you until finally one day your body can't take it anymore and your heart stops beating and you get to then go on to be the glory. No, he said, I want you to have life and life more abundantly. I, I'm not talking about that everything's peachy and perfect, but I'm talking about that the things that are going on in your world do not dictate where you are spiritually, but the things that are, that the truth of who you are spiritually dictates the things that are going on around you. See, what we've made the mistake of is we have allowed the world around us to determine what's going on within us instead of what's going on within us determining the world around us. And so God wants to do such an effective and efficient work in your life that everywhere you go, you're like Peter, everywhere that he went, that in, in the book of Acts, it says that they, they would bring the sick out into the streets and lay them up on the side of the road so that even the shadow of Peter would, would fall on some of the sick people and they'd get healed. Why? Because Peter was living in fullness of life. He was living in an awareness of the presence of God to the degree that his very shadow contained glory enough to heal somebody. That's fullness of life. That's fullness of life. Let me ask you, how many people in your life that don't go to church with you even know you're a Christian? How many people in your family have ever heard you pray? Hey, how many people in your world have ever seen you do anything that would mark you as a follower of Jesus Christ? It's a good question because the fullness of life that he's called us to is not just one of existing out in the world and then thriving within the church. No, 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 no. It's about thriving. Every beat of my heart is exuding his glory and his presence and his power because I am not dead anymore. I have been made alive with Christ. So listen to this in 1 John. This is going to, I got to mess with you a little bit because, see, I grew up in, in a church in, in, a, in, in very conservative, uh, reserved Baptist uh, background, and I grew up with this, this mentality that, that all the good stuff is laid up for us in heaven. I, I was taught that. I was taught that one day I'll be fully alive. You know, you ever you heard people say when Billy Graham died, you know, they, they, they had the quote. They said, you know, uh, you know, supposedly Billy Graham said this, but I don't know if he really did. I've heard other people say that they said this before, too, so I don't, I don't know. But I've seen the quote that said, you know, one day you're going to hear that Billy Graham has died. Don't you believe it for a minute, because at that moment I'll be more alive than ever. You know, have you, did y'all see that when Billy Graham died? The problem is, is that, see, I don't believe that God is, is 
really wanting us to wait to die to be fully alive. That doesn't line up with Scripture. That does not line up with the gospel to say one day when I die and go to heaven, then I will be fully alive. That does not line up with the Bible. And I'm going to show you why. Who wants to know why? Say, prove it, Pastor Will. Okay, all right, I will. I'm glad you asked. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 says this in verse 15. I'm going to start there. It says, And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. In other words, we believe because we have seen, we've experienced the risen Jesus. Now watch. Verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So two parts. God abides in him, and he abides in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Watch this, verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, listen to this, as he is, so are we. Say that with me. As he is, so are we in this world. Is Jesus alive? Is Jesus fully alive? What did the Bible just tell me? As he is, so am I when I get to heaven. No, 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 no. That's not what it said. What did it say? In this world. Come on. You hear that? That means you're not waiting to be resurrected in the last day. You're not waiting to be resurrected whenever Jesus comes back and splits the sky and steps on the Mount of Olives. You know when you can be resurrected? Today. Right here. Right now. He said you can be as he is in this world. You're not waiting for some distant day. We kick the can. And you know what? Religion has told us it's okay to do that because it's a lot easier to believe for one day I'll get right than to believe that God can actually do it in my life today. It's a whole lot easier Christianity to believe that one day God's going to set all the issues in my life in order than to believe that God's going to do it today. It's a whole lot easier to believe that one day whenever I cross over into the other side, into glory, into another realm, then I will be fully alive because then it takes away the responsibility that I feel to be fully alive today. You see, if you really want to live with resurrection life, there becomes a responsibility in you, in, in you to live that way. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen because you, just, you were in the right place at the right time. Resurrection power comes into the life of a person who is hungry for God and wants to be in His presence. And then the expression of God's presence in your life becomes that you are fully alive. You're fully alive. You're not just sucking oxygen on planet Earth with a heartbeat. You're fully alive. Mm, yeah, that's good. In every way. Man. This is God's will for us. When, when, we, when we really step from death into life, now, I, I, I believe that, that probably the majority of this room has made a decision to receive by faith the gift of the grace of God that covers the sin with His blood that washes us white as snow so that we can be cleansed and made right and made atoned for and in in, in the, our relationship with God is then restored. I believe, I believe the majority of everybody in this room, I'm not going to say everybody in this room, the majority of everybody in this room probably has made that decision to follow Jesus and you are born again, you've been saved. But let me ask you, are you fully alive? Because there's a difference. There's a difference. And, and I'm telling you, the only place that you can fully come alive is in the presence of God. The only place that you find fullness of life is in God's presence. And this is why we're doing this this week. We're not having a series of meetings this week so that we can, we can, we can just come in here and have church all week long. Come on, give me a break, man. I've had enough church. Like, if that's all there is to this thing, man, I'm just, I'm going to go fishing or something. Like, Seriously. 
If there's nothing more, if this is just church, man, I'm just, I'm tired of church. I've been doing church my whole life. I'm tired of church. Some, some of you here, you, you, you was in church before you was born like me. And the truth is, is that we don't need more church. We need more of him. We need more of his presence. We need more because it's in his presence. I'm coming alive, man. I am something different every time I walk out of this place having encountered him. Every time. And so, so I can fully, listen, this, this, is, this is what's awesome about this. I can fully believe this. That if I come into the house of God and I encounter him, which we have and we do on a regular basis, and we should more and more and more and more. As we encounter him, guess what happens? I am being changed into his likeness. That's why we were just singing it just a while ago because that's what's in my heart right now. God, I want to be like you. I want to be like my father. I want to be more and more like my father. Let me, let me ask you something. Do you, do you think that Adam was in the garden trying to figure out how to get to heaven? No, he wasn't trying to figure out. Why? Because heaven was already here. He was in heaven. Was Adam trying to figure out how to get to heaven? No. Because he walked with God in the cool of the day. He looked like his father. In fact, Adam looked so much like his father that all of creation responded to Adam as if he were his father. Listen to that. God so imparted his nature and his character and his likeness into Adam, who, remember, was made out of dirt. Yeah? He wasn't made out of heavenly dirt. Glorious dirt. He was made out of dirt. Probably some of this stuff like what that red stuff we have here. And God shaped him and he made him. And he said, let us make man in our own image. And he gave him by his words. See, he he encountered this pile of dirt. And when God encountered this pile of dirt, he made this pile of dirt look like him. And when he made the dirt look like him, all of creation submitted itself to the man that looked like God. Everything was subject to Adam. The birds, the fish, the beasts of the field. Everything was subject. I I believe that Adam could even control the weather in the garden. What was the weather like in the garden? Whatever Adam preferred. Like, I think I want it to be a little cooler today. Okay. Why? Because he looked just like his father. He looked just like God. And because he looked just like God, even the wind and the waves obeyed him. Just like they did Jesus. When Jesus was asleep in the boat and he got up and, and his disciples were all flipping out because there was a wind and the waves and they thought the boat was going to sink and they, they woke Jesus up and he got up and he rebuked the storm and he said, peace, be still. And his disciples were like, whoa. They were astonished, the Bible says. And they sat down and they scratched their heads and they go, who is this guy? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Why? Why? I don't believe it was because Jesus was, was just super filled with faith at that moment. He just woke up. He's probably still like... <sighs> he just looked enough like his father that when he said it, the wind and the waves had to submit. Listen. Listen. When you and I are in the presence of God, we are being made like Him. Let me put it to you this way. If there are things in your life that are not becoming subject to you, you haven't been in the presence of God enough. Because everything in your life will become subject to you the more you look like your Father. And the more you get in His presence, the more you look like Him. The Bible says when we see Him, we'll be made like Him. As we encounter Him, He's creating us into the same image he's restoring to us what adam lost in the garden what did adam lose in the garden it wasn't just the garden the, it, it, what, adam didn't just lose the garden he lost the image he 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 lost the image he started looking like dirt again instead of the father and when adam sinned in the garden the first thing he realized is hey i look different the bible says that he realized he was naked and he ran and he was afraid and he hid himself among the trees of the garden 
Adam was not in the garden trying to figure out how to get to heaven because heaven was already there. Adam was in the garden trying to figure out how to exercise the authority that he'd been given. And you and I, because of the blood of Jesus and because of the resurrection that we celebrated last Sunday, have been granted back into the place of the image of the Father. We've been given the authority to come boldly into the presence of God. Go read Hebrews. To come boldly before the throne of grace so that we can begin this process of being transformed and being made new and being resurrected like Jesus so that when we walk out of this place, we look like Him. We sound like Him. We speak to cancer and it obeys because we look like the Father. We talk to diabetes and it changes because We look like the Father. Listen, the more I'm with Him, the more breakthrough I'm going to experience out here. Because the more I'm with Him, the more I start to look like Him. You ever been around somebody that's fully alive? Have you ever been around somebody that's fully alive? Have you you ever encountered somebody that looked like the Father? That's been in his presence enough. One of the, I mean, the greatest compliment anybody's ever given me before. Somebody told me I look like John Travolta one time. That was not the greatest compliment that I could have ever gotten before. The greatest compliment somebody ever gave me before was I, I met somebody for the very first time, didn't know him from anybody, and they, they bumped into me. And, and uh, I was at, a, at a, a service somewhere, and they said, they just stopped and they looked at me and said, You've been with the Lord. I can see it. You've been with him. Why? Because I don't know. I mean, I've, I've definitely had some down days. I don't even remember what kind of day I was having that day, but I remember that, that when they said that, I was going, wow, that's pretty awesome. That's exactly how I want to look. I want the world to know who he is because they see him on me. They see his life on me because I'm fully alive just as he is fully alive. You can talk about the resurrection and you can go have church at Easter and do all of the resurrection stuff and talk about the stone is rolled away and he is risen and he's no longer there. And Why are you seeking the living among the dead? And we can talk about all that stuff. But the truth is, is the reason all of that makes sense to you and to me is because the day that he got up out of that grave is the same day that I was given access to get up and come out of that grave. And I am now as alive as I choose to be because he is fully alive and so if I'm going to be fully alive I need to first believe he's a fully alive and as I encounter him he is making me look like him fully alive first John 4 tells us something that religion tried to trick us see religion tried to tell us no you'll be made fully alive whenever you die I mean When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Can we remember that? When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory because we're certainly not going to do it now. (laughs) Agreed. I, I fully agree. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Fully agree. No problem. My problem is that when we kick the can down the road and we say, what a day of rejoicing that will be. See, it takes the responsibility off of it being this day. When I know that the Bible tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. This is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Not when we all get to heaven. And when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory because I'll finally be fully alive. What if I told you you can see Him now and you can be fully alive now? And 1 John 4 tells us that every single one of us in here as we've received the Lord Jesus, I want to read it again. We have known and believed that the love of God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. And love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. 
Praise the Lord. Man, I've only gotten to one scripture here, and I've got a couple more to go. So y'all, y'all hang with me. I'm going to do this as quick as I can. Just a real brief recap. Last week, I, I read from you Galatians 2. 20, and I wanted to give you these scriptures because these make a lot of sense when you think about the, the context of what we're talking about right now. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, and yet I live. He says, not I, but Christ lives in me, Galatians 2.20. So it, I have been crucified with Christ. I, I, I did, he didn't just die for me. He died as me so that now I can, be a, I can be raised to new life with him. So look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. It says this. Let me read it to you real fast. If you, if you don't get a chance to get there, let me just read it for you. Is that all right? Yeah? Okay. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 says, And you, say me, and you he made alive. Wait, when? When? When did he do that? Who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, this is it, but God. This is how he did it. He made us alive, but God. This is how, he's about to tell us, you ready? But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. Where, wait, he made us alive together with Christ. When was Christ made alive? On resurrection day that we celebrate Easter, we talk about Jesus is alive. No, 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 he wants to know, are you alive? Yeah, the question of whether Jesus is alive, that's an old story, man. Yeah, he's alive. The question is, are you alive? You were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but are you alive now? Watch this. And, let me read verse 5 again. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together. Get this. And made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He raised us up together. Together with who? Jesus. Jesus. We, he raised us up together with Jesus. And he made us sit together in heavenly places with Jesus. So, so before you were ever even born, you had already risen from the dead. The day you got saved was not the day you got saved. The day you got saved is when your body and your mind caught up with something that had already happened thousands of years ago. Does that not mess with you? Because that messes with me, man. That's mind-blowing. Revelation 13 says that Jesus is the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. That means he died before there was ever even a tree that could be chopped down and made into a cross to hang him on. He died for the sins of the world before the world even existed. The lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. What happened then 2,000 years ago on the hill of Calvary on the cross? The, the, the natural caught up with something that had already happened in the spiritual. All right, I'm going to get off of that because you guys are going to get all... But it's amazing. I'm just trying to let you know this is a big deal, man. This is This is huge. We're talking about, good. man. Whew. So the truth is, is that if, if you've been made alive in Christ, the question is not whether or not you're alive. It's a question of whether or not you have allowed your mind and your body to realize it yet. When we start living like we're alive because we've had a revelation of what real life looks like. And when we start to see what real life looks like and we make a conscious decision to live like real life, you know what, this is what happens. This is what happens. We're, 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 we're really good at preaching about the, the death and burial. Like, I, absolutely. I mean, I love, thank God for the cross and we talk and we preach the cross and we, we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Absolutely, that is the gospel. That is the glorious message of Christ. That He died for the sins of mankind. Absolutely, don't get away from the cross. We are never going to leave the message of the cross. Absolutely, we'll not do it. But the truth is, is that also, in addition to the cross, there's got to be a resurrection. 
Because you see, there was, there was also other people that died on crosses. Jesus wasn't the only person to ever die on a cross. He wasn't the only person to ever be unjustly tortured and killed. But he's the only one that did it and got up from the grave. Yeah? Yeah? You can go talk, talk about Buddha and Muhammad and, 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 and all the, 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 I don't know, wacky weirdo stuff that's out there. And if you go get into all that stuff, listen, I go check it out. That's fine. They're all dead. And they're all still dead. And if you want to know where real life is, you better go find somebody that was dead but now is alive. So it's not just the cross. It can't stop at the cross. But here's what religion did. Religion said, here's what Christianity looks like. You got to come in here and you got to repent of your sin and you got to put all this down. Put down all that worldly stuff. Put it down, put it down, put it down, put it down, put it down. Absolutely. 100% agree. Put it down. Get your hands off of it. But the reason why God is wanting you to put it down is not just so that you can remain empty-handed. He wants you to put that down so you can take something else up. And the reason why so many people come into the house of God and they get born again, they give their heart to Jesus, they get saved, and then they walk out the door and, and, and they, don't, they don't last. They end up right back where they were before. They end up in a big old mess and they end up living even sometimes a lot worse than they were before. The reason why that happens is not because they didn't have a genuine encounter with God. It's because we didn't show them that there's actually not, it's not just about the death and burial. It's also about resurrection. It's also about taking up fullness of life. Man, I'm telling you, the, the, look, the reason Adam in the garden, the reason why Adam sinned in the garden, if he had been feasting on the tree of life as he should have been, he never would have been tempted by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The problem wasn't the alluring sense of the, of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That, the, that wasn't the problem. The problem was is that Adam wasn't feeding himself adequately from the right sources. And so the reason why some people come in and they struggle to stay committed to Christ, they struggle to stay surrendered to God's will in their life, they, they struggle to, to follow through, is not because of the allurement of the world, which is what, why the church has been so stupid to try to win people to Jesus by looking just like the world. That's foolishness. It's foolish to think that I can be like the world and that's somehow going to change your life. And so we play secular music in the church. And so we, we I mean, we, we, pack, we, we do anything we can do to get you in here. Uh, and, and then once you're in here and you repeat a prayer after me, we don't care how you live anymore. We're going to tally you up there as a win. That's not a win. Let me tell you what a win looks like. A win looks like this. When somebody gives their life to Jesus in 10 years, they're not still at that same spot, but they have grown and they've moved forward and they've matured and they've become who God destined them to be. That's a win. That's a win. You can have a church of 10,000 people be a half an inch deep. That's not successful. Success in the kingdom of God is whenever we actually are being transformed into his image and his likeness. I don't want a church full of people that still look like the world. I want a church full of people that look like Jesus. Come on. I, I'll, take, I'll take a handful over thousands of the other. It's not about that. And the reason why people have been disappointed with Christianity is because they said, look, I laid it down, I laid it down, I laid it down. But then they never picked anything back up. They didn't never pick up the right things. I'm telling you, man, when you start, to, when, when you encounter him on a regular basis, this is why, man, this is where revival comes from. Revival doesn't happen because we schedule it. Revival happens because we refuse to live without it. That's when revival happens. Revival happens when you taste it and you taste him, you taste his goodness, and you're like, I refuse. I'm going to be here whether anybody else is here or not. I'm going to be waiting outside that door tomorrow night, and if you're not here, I don't care because I'm here for him. And once I taste it, I'm not going back, man. I'll do this for the rest of my life. I'll, get, I'll change whatever I need to change. I'll, I'll give up whatever I need to give up because, see, I figured out that if I put this down, I can pick him up. And if I put this down, I can pick up his spirit. I can pick up his glory. I can pick up his presence. And so I put all these other things down, not because I'm sacrificing for the Lord. No, I'm giving that so I can have this. Yeah. Revival doesn't happen because we schedule it. It happens because we can't help it. We just got to be with him. We're not willing to live without it anymore. 
So don't come this week because it's scheduled. Come this week because you want Him. Because you're not, you're, you're not willing to do life without Him anymore. People, do you realize when, when the glory of God fell in Br- at Brownsville Assembly of God in 1995, you know, people that, that, that op- ran and operated million dollar uh, businesses and, and contracts that were doing different things, they, they threw it all to the wind. They said, I refuse to miss this. They pulled their children out of school. They started homeschooling their children because they said, we're going to be here. We're going to be a part of this. We're going to start doing what God's doing. We're going to be in the middle of this thing. And I'm not talking about just a handful. I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people said, I am going to completely rearrange my world to be where he is because I've figured out this. When I'm with him, I'm fully alive. I'm not fully alive when I get a big paycheck. I'm not fully alive whenever I'm out on the golf course. I'm not fully alive when I'm doing any of this other stuff. I'm fully alive when I'm with him. And so I refuse to do without him anymore. That's when revival comes. It sounds, it sounds really easy. What time is it? I'm excited. Can y'all tell? I'm looking forward. Hmm. Philippians chapter 3. And I'm just kind of just bumping up into a few things that I talked about Sunday. Verse 7. Paul says, But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted lost for Christ. I, I, you see, he figured out something. If I'll put that down, I can pick this up. If, if, if I put, if I, oh, all right, you get that, you get it. Verse 8, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now let me ask you something. Is Paul saved? Do you think Paul, the apostle, that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, is saved? At the time that he wrote this. Yes? Can we all agree? Paul is a believer. He's a, he's a believer. He's a Christian. He's saved. Paul's in heaven right now. He's with Jesus. Yes? Okay. So watch. He's saved, so what's he trying to get here? What's he trying to do? Yet indeed I count all things as lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, that I may gain Christ? What? I thought you were already saved, Paul. I thought you were already Christian. What are you trying to gain Christ for? Unless there's something more to it than we thought. Unless there's more to gaining Christ than just getting saved. Unless it's gaining Him to the place that I begin to look like Him. Listen to what He says. That I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him. Now, wait a minute, Paul. I thought you were saved. I thought you already knew Him. Paul, you don't know Jesus? You ever, you ever heard somebody do that when they're witnessing somebody? They go up to them and they go, do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Do you know Jesus? Paul acts like he didn't. Yet we all agree that Paul was saved. Yeah. That I may know him. See, the problem is, is that we think we understand what knowing is all about. But knowing is not just about what you can tell me about somebody. Knowing is about experiencing him. Not just experiencing him like if I was to say... I was sitting at a red light, and I, I, I saw a wreck happen. I saw somebody uh, ha- had an accident right in front of me at the red light. I could say more so than somebody that wasn't there, I could say, I know what happened. I was there, right? Right? I mean, I know what happened because I was there. 
Now, somebody else that wasn't there might say, well, I know what happened too, because somebody told me. But they don't really know what happened. They probably just know what somebody else said because they heard somebody else say, and, right? So that's not really knowing just because somebody told you something. Yeah? That's not really knowing because somebody told you something. And it's not really knowing, really, to the depth that this scripture is talking here, it's not really knowing to say, I know because I was sitting at the red light when it happened. Because see, then I'm basing just what my eyes have seen as to what I know. Paul said that I may know him. And it's not just, in philosophy, it's not just a philosophical knowing. It's an experience. I've experienced him fully. The, the, the actual word that's used here, that, that, that is, is used for, for know here, is, is also a, 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 an idiom for a, a sexual relationship between a man and a woman. It's to know in an experiential way. Does that mess with you a little bit? i got to know him, not just about him because somebody told me, not just because I saw him do something in somebody's life, I was just sitting at the red light and I saw the wreck happen. No, I know him because I was in the car and I was the one. And my life came head to head with Jesus himself. I know him not because of what they said and, I, and not know him just because of what I've seen him do in other people's lives. I know him because of what he's done in me to know him. Paul said, I got to know him. And the power of his resurrection. What is that? The, the life, the fullness of life, the coming alive, the power of the fullness of life. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Oh, man, we shouldn't have read that part. I wish Paul wouldn't have put that part in there. He said, I want more than anything to know him, to experience him, to know the power of his resurrection. And I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Being conformed to his death Listen, being conformed to his death, if by any means, I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. I said this last week. You can't attain to salvation. You can't attain to what's going to happen to you the day that you die and pass over into glory. You can't attain that by natural means. It can't be done. It's by grace you've been saved through faith, right? You can't do it. If you could do it, then you could have saved yourself and Jesus wouldn't have had to die. You can't save yourself. It's not you. It's not in your works. It's not in your ability. So what are you trying to attain here, Paul? What are you trying to attain? The resurrection of the dead? What are you talking about? Being fully alive. Because I've encountered him. That is revival. That is revival. It doesn't just impact me when I'm in this building. It impacts me when I get home. It impacts me whenever I'm sitting down talking to my wife. It impacts me whenever I'm talking to my children. It impacts me when I go to work. It impacts me when I go to the store. It impacts me everywhere that I go. I'm riding in the car. It impacts me then too because I'm not just talking about a, a, a knowing that I saw something happen. I'm talking about a knowing that it happened to me and I am completely wrecked. Because you ever heard somebody say that before? I'm a, I'm wrecked. I'm a wreck. I want us, I want us to have, have a collision with the resurrected Jesus. That's what's about to happen in your life this week. You're about to have a collision with the resurrected Jesus. And you're going to experience fullness of life. Whew. Man, did y'all, y'all with me? Did you check out? Did y'all, y'all already gone home on me? Come on. Man. That's good. All right, got one more scripture? Can I, can I read you one more? All right, one more. I'll do it quick, but it's too good not to. Romans chapter 8. Man, if I read the whole thing, I'm probably going to stop. So uh, just go with me. R verse 1. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Come on, somebody say, thank you, Lord. Who do not walk according to the flesh, 
but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weakened through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Now here's what God did. God said, okay, Adam was in the garden. He looked like God. He looked like his father. When Adam sinned, he didn't look like his father anymore. And so now, rather than all of creation being subject to him, he became subject to all of creation. Yeah? So, and, and even darkness and death. He was subject to death because he didn't look like his father anymore. Keep, follow this. So what was God's remedy? What did God do? Romans 8 says that He sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So in order for God to get us to look like Him again, He had to send His own Son, who did look like Him, to make Him look like us so that He could die in our place so that then we can look like him again. You see what happened? The only way to reverse the curse was for God to take on the flesh that looked like sin. He had to become sin for you and for me so that we could be made in the likeness of Christ. This is some heavy stuff this morning, man. I hope you can get this. mm. God looked like us. So that we could look like Him. And watch, I'm not done yet. Verse 4. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Man, we just don't have time. I'm sorry. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. They set their mind on the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And there's so much here, man. Take some time this week and meditate on Romans 8. Just take some time and just ask the Lord to speak to you through Romans 8. Man, this is powerful. Because the carnal mind, that's the fleshly mind, that's the sinful mind, is at enmity against God. Now, it's not just the carnal, the fleshly sinfulness. It's just, it's anything that doesn't look like God is at an enemy of God. It's at enmity with Him. It's, it's, it's making war against His character and His nature. This is why Adam realizes, oh wow, I'm naked. And then immediately he's ashamed and he runs and hides. Why? Because all of a sudden he didn't look like the Father anymore and he realizes what I look like. I look like His enemy. Why was Adam hiding in the garden amongst the trees? Because all of a sudden Adam looked at himself and he realized he had the wrong jersey on. I look like the enemy. And if God sees me like this, he might destroy me. So Adam hid himself. Was that ever God's intention? Absolutely not. He said, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send my son. And I'm going to allow my son to be destroyed in your place. I'm going to let him put on the wrong jersey. Man, are you feeling that right now? Oh, Why did Adam run and hide in the garden? Because he realized, I'm an enemy of God now. And I don't want to be an enemy of God. Neither do you. So then, verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Because you're an enemy of God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you... Listen now. Listen, listen, listen. Good. You're going to have to turn on your mind here for a second and your heart. Listen to me. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life 
to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Now listen, He said, I'm going to give, I'm going to bring revival, I'm going to bring life to you. You're going to have fullness of life, and here's why. He says, to your mortal bodies. I like that he threw that in there because just in case you were still stuck on the religious track that told you this was for heaven one day, he said, your mortal bodies, not your immortal bodies, your mortal bodies I'm going to bring alive. He's not waiting for you to come into immortality and then he's going to do a work in you. No. He said, I'll take you right where you are. Right there. I'm going to, I love, I love the, the, the King James Version says that he quickens your mortal bodies. He quickens, I like the word quickens because it's just cool. But it, he, he makes alive. You know what the word mortal means? Subject to death. That's what it means. So if you're immortal, you're not subject to death. Now we know that you and I, we know that, 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 all, all of us in here, in the flesh, are subject to death, right? I mean, tragic things happen, sickness happens, things happen. I mean, we still live in a broken, fallen planet. The bottom line is this. He said he wants to quicken your mortal body. Ha, quicken your mortal body. Bring to life your mortal body. That means in this life, Right here, right now, God wants to bring you to the place of being fully alive. Cancer is not an option in the body of one being quickened. Yeah? No? I mean, come on, do you believe that? You believe that? He wants to quicken your mortal body? You say, well, I don't know, sometimes it's God's will. Are you crazy? What, 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 what work of God is death and destruction? You've got him mixed up. You've mistaken him for another. God wants to quicken your mortal body. This is revival. This is revival. And it's not just when you're sick. It's not just when you're sad. It's not just when you're going through a hard time. He wants to quicken your mortal body. There's a reason why His mercies are new every morning. There's a reason why your mercy, His mercies are new every morning. And His kindness and His goodness are new every single day. Morning by morning by morning. You know that... that, that <sighs> Jesus is the bright morning star. Why? Because I believe it's every day we be made into his image, fully alive, fully alive. Come on, you're not waiting to cross over into, into glory. It's not a matter of crossing over into glory. It's a matter of realizing the glory that's already around you. Choosing to live in it. You know that tree of life that Adam was eaten from in the garden? It represented something more than just food. I'm closing. Baby, you can come get on the keys for me if you don't mind. So I'll hush. Huh? She said that doesn't work. Sometimes it makes it worse. Oh. That tree of life was not just about food in the garden. Who realizes that? Adam had plenty to eat. He, had, he could choose, he could eat from any tree in the garden except for the one. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because God knew that there was something in that tree that was going to, to cause his nature to be changed. His appearance, his, his very nature to be transformed and changed. He would begin to look like his enemy. But the tree of, the, of life that's in the middle of the garden was meant to be not just food for him, but it was meant to be relationship. And, and God said it in the middle of the garden, I believe on purpose, and because, you know, it, it's something when, when you, um, 
when you live in a place long enough, you can walk around and things that, that you see all the time become invisible to you. You know, have you ever, have you ever done that before? Sometimes, you know, we, we live in, we, we just did some work cleaning and touching up paint and just, you know, doing a lot of work around here. And it's like, man, when it was done, I, I was looking around going, wow, I didn't realize there was that much to do. But man, it made a big difference. This place looks so great. It was, looks brand new again. Everything, you know, I mean, there's still little things here and there to do. But I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty awesome. Like I, I had grown blind to some of the, the things that needed to be done just because I saw them all the time. And I think that's kind of what happened in that garden is Adam saw that tree all the time. And that tree represented more than food. It represented his relationship with the Father. And you see, every time he ate of that tree, it renewed him in the image of the Father. And so the reason why God said, well, we've got to get him out of this garden because he's, he's now he's in this sinful state. And if he eats of that tree, it's, it's, gonna, it's not going to be good because he's going to continue to live. And, and, he, and, and he won't be able to live in fullness of life. He'll just live getting by, waiting to die. Listen, do you know what, the, what religion has convinced the children of God? that you're just waiting to die. You're just like Adam. Just waiting to die so that one day you can be back with the Father. Just waiting to die. It's what religion told you. If you've, been, if you've been in the church five minutes, this is what religion tried to tell you. If you grew up in the church, religion has told you you're just waiting to die. And I think it's because that's exactly what the enemy wants you to believe about yourself. You're just waiting to die. Because when you die, you'll get to go be with the Father and you'll be like Him and all these things. It'll be, it'll be all good. But until then, you might as well suck it up. You might as well suck it up. You're going to be miserable. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. Come on, you hear me? That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. The tree of life has been made available again. And that tree of life is, is producing fruit every day. Adam fell into trouble when he quit feeding himself from the tree of life. And he realized, oh, I'm hungry. And he saw this other fruit and it was appealing to him. That fruit never would have been appealing to him if he had adequately been feeding himself from life and life more abundantly. If he had had the fruit of life in his hand, he wouldn't have had room for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So if you're struggling with something in here today and you're, you're struggling with, with something that, that you just can't seem to shake off of your life, I want you to know it's not an issue of whether or not you have the strength and the willpower to shake it off. It's a, it's a matter of what are, what's in your hands. What's in your hands? Because if you're holding on to this stuff, you can't be holding on to Him. But if you're holding on to Him, you won't be holding on to that either. You won't be holding on to that stuff. It, it's going to start to fall off. It's going to start to starve in your life. It's going to start to fall away. Because what you found is so much more fulfilling. It's so much more life-giving. It's so much more substantial. It's so much more valuable. It's so much sweeter. It's so much stronger. It's just better. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And every day, you have to make a choice. Just like Adam again in the garden. What tree are you going to eat from? What tree? That's revival. Revival is choosing the tree of life. Listen, this week is not about a series of meetings. This week is about a tree. You hear me, church? This week is about a tree. It's about a tree. It's about laying down some fruit so I can take hold of real life. Does anybody hear me this morning? Are y'all with me? Am I, am, I, am I good? Okay. 
Praise the Lord. I don't even know how to respond to that. I, I feel like this is a setup. I feel like this is a setup right here. And I feel like you need to leave this place today with this on your heart. Don't Please don't walk out of this place today and just, just go, oh, that was nice, and move on. Don't let yourself do that. Stay engaged with what the Lord's doing right now. And leave this place today with a heart hungry for Him. I have to have fullness of life. I have to have it. I am not willing to continue living without Him. Not willing to do it. Not willing to do it. Listen, this is going to this is going to change everything. It's going to change your home. It's going to change your family. It's going to change your marriage. It's going to change your finances. It's going to change this town. It's going to change this town. It'll never be the same again. Who's with me today? Who's with me today? Wave at me if you're with me today. You got you hear the word of the Lord today, Father. Do this. Do this, Father. Make us again in your likeness. Make us again in your image. Bring fullness of life. Fullness of life. Lord, I thank you for the awakening, God, to your truth that's happening in this place. I thank you that, that there are hearts that are willing to be stretched. I thank you, God, that, that even when we, when we see things different than we've always understood them to be, Lord, that you give us a grace to receive it, to walk in it, to follow it, Lord, to allow it to transform us. I thank you for that grace. Listen, it's the grace of God that brings you through the death. It's the grace of God that brings you through the burial. But it's also the grace of God that awakens you from the sleep, and it calls you up from the grave, and it induces you into into His life, into pure life. And I'm calling out to God right now, Lord, send Your life in this place. Send Your life to every family, to every home, to every person, every individual, Lord, that steps in this building this week would encounter true Zoe life, fullness of life. Lord, let it overflow in this place. Lord, I, I'm calling out, Father, for, for there to be a restoration of true, authentic life in Christ. Not just to talk about you or to know about you, but to know and experience you. To find you face to face. To know you. To become like you as we see you. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in this house. And I, I pray, Father, for every person still living and operating inside of death at enmity with you. God, that they would come running into your grace and into your provision, your power for newness of life today. That none of us would be able to leave this place today still in darkness, still in death, but fully embracing the fullness of life that you paid for us to have. By your blood, Jesus, we welcome this. We welcome this, Holy One. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. All right. So who's, who's coming tonight, 7 o'clock? Come pray with us. All right, good. Be looking for you. We're going to come pray. As I've said to you uh, 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 many, many times, nothing happens without prayer. And, I, and I'm telling you, if ever this church needs to be praying, it's right now right now so come pray with us uh come pray with us tonight starting at seven o'clock and i don't know how long we'll go we'll just go if you need to come and go that's fine if you need to leave that's fine i just uh, invite you to just come and pray and and just to set your heart in order and before the lord and ask the lord to prepare you for what he wants to do in this place this week i'm excited for uh, this room to be filled with hunger. Um, listen, tomorrow night when we start, we kick this thing off at 6 o'clock. I encourage you to get on in here and get ready, get started. Eat, look, don't, don't even wait for, for, for somebody to engage you from the front. Don't wait for the, the worship to start before you start engaging the Lord. Come in here and call out to God. Come in here to begin to pray. Come in here to begin to seek His face. Begin to, begin to call upon the Lord because I'm telling you, man, we don't have time to mess around this week. I, 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 want, us to, I want us to come into this place intentionally seeking Him and don't wait for somebody else to pull you into it. No, you be the initiator. You go after God with all of your heart. Amen? Amen. Hey, God bless you. I love you. Has anybody got anything else? Honey, got anything you need us to say before we wrap this up? Nope. Chrissy, we good? Everybody else is good? Okay. I love you guys. God bless you. You got something, Ricky? Come on down here. I felt like somebody over here did. Go ahead. Come on, brother. Where's the microphone at? Yeah, you do. It's, it's, not, it's not official unless there's a microphone. Here you go. So all week, 
I've had this word. And I've come in here and prayed every day. I want to share this word. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, and I would hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. Yeah. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there here forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. <clears throat> I honestly didn't know what perpetually meant, so I had to look it up. Never ending or changing. Occurring repeatedly so frequently as to seem endless and uninterrupted. My eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Never ending or changing. Occurring so frequently to seem endless and uninterrupted. That is God's endless love. I encourage you to come pray. If not here, everywhere you're at, in your car, wherever, wherever you are, reach out to God. I pray that His name is here forever. And that His eyes and His heart will be here Perpetually, I believe that. I believe it. Receive it. Believe it with all your heart. He's so good. He's so good. He's here. And He's never leaving. He's here forever. Forever. Perpetually. God bless you. That's good. Thank you, brother. Yeah, that's the word. Hey, we love you guys. God bless you. Have a wonderful uh, rest of the afternoon.